Welcome back to another roundtable conversation with Rev One. I am your host, Ahmad the Poet, and I'm once again joined by the men of Rev One. We have Kamau Latunji and Tunji Adebayo, and today we have a very special guest, somebody who's going to help us dive into how modern education is affecting society. We have, we're joined by Butler Professor, entrepreneur, community builder, and public speaker, Professor Anthony Murdoch II. How you gentlemen doing? Come on, man. Good I didn't know I knew we had all that sauce. God been God <laughs> God the time. Good to be here. Hey, we here. <laughs> it's good That's to, a fact. It's good to sit down with y'all brothers. I wanted to um, dive right in. I feel like it'd be a, a timely question just to ask, you know, how does perseverance play into um, achieving higher education? Just talk about the importance of perseverance and anybody can go. You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to say just in the context of higher education because uh, I took a different route when it came to higher education. I opted out of a traditional college or university um, dynamic, but I would say perseverance is so key in so many facets of life, you know? And I think one of the things that my dad told me when I decided that I didn't want to go the tradi traditional route and, mm -hmm. and continue uh, my sophomore, my uh, junior, my senior year, and, and whatever else came after that, when I wanted to opt out, um, you know, he told me that education didn't just stop or start mm -hmm. in a classroom, mm -hmm. that, I, that it required a certain mindset and a conviction to continue to educate yourself. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's a lot of times when you're not in school, when you're just in life and so many things is happening that you don't feel like I need to get any smarter. Like, I just need to figure things out. Like, I just need to, you know, figure out how to pay my bills or I got to figure out like how to get this thing done or whatever, you know. And there's a certain level of commitment that you have to keep going, you know, to keep elevating, to keep rising. Um, you know, and just to navigate it, like, just to be here today, you know, uh, I think I think we all know, like, it's no secret um, how many things went wrong today um, that was easy. Any one of them was just to chuck it up and been like, it wasn't meant to be or, you know, we don't need to do it. Just like, let's, but it was just like, we had a vision in mind to have a beautiful conversation. And it's a perseverance that's required in any equation that results in success, perseverance is somewhere in there. But to your point, do y'all feel like, I mean, and I've, it's, it's a question for everybody, do you guys feel like college is overrated? Or is it something that is still like, has the value that it once had maybe decades ago in today's society? Or Because I hear a lot of stuff about skills and right. you know, like people doing different things with coding and Google has all types of programs. Is college still as relevant today as it was? I say absolutely. And it's because it's how you approach it. If you just go there as a cog in a machine, on, then you're going to leave and it being overrated. On, but the most important thing I left with was networking. Mm -hmm. Was this person next to me, this dean of this school, this person that is living the life that I would like to live, mm -hmm. that has a connection to somebody. The people on that college campus is crazy, mm -hmm. no matter where you go. But if you close your mouth, you don't get fed. So the most important thing I learned is networking. And second thing is the opportunity that's there is beyond your degree. Mm -hmm. I tell every student, leave there with a piece of paper that gets you paid. Mm -hmm. Like that degree may not get you paid. But for me, it was a cert certification in personal training. Uh, another one of my bros, he got something in IT, even though that wasn't his main degree. Because there was, it was discounted at the school. There was this opportunity, there was this program, 50% off, 30% off. You go into this studio and you could just do it. So I say, if you have a degree where you're chasing a dream, leave with a sheet of paper that gets you paid. If I could feed off of that, yeah. and it's to what he just said, it's about intention. We talked about that before we walked right. in. When, when you walk into any environment mm. without intention, you're gonna leave with what someone else wanted you to, right. not you did. So I could walk into this facility, Mm -hmm. and I could walk in here and get something that I wanted to get that no one else did because I walked in and said I want to get it. Mm -hmm. Or I could leave mm -hmm. just as confused as I did when I walked in the door. Facts. Mm -hmm. What I think about with college, I don't, and I don't care if we're talking about Ivy League or Ivy Tech. Ivy League, Ivy Tech, large community college system in the country mm -hmm. based out of Indiana. Either one, I think about the access to resource and tool. And in large part, and I'm not going to get into the economics of higher education or college specifically right now, because one of the reasons why the value of a college degree is being questioned is because they're becoming more expensive 
and the return on that investment right. is not matching, you know, the job market, Definitely what not. it costs to pay your rent, what it costs to ride the freaking bus. Mm. What I will say, though, is college is an experience that's in large part informed by relationships. I can walk into a state-of-the-art studio, whether I'm there for a semester or for seven years, and inside of that studio, top-tier cameras, top-tier audio equipment, top-tier teaching faculty that even may not have the practical experience I do, but have a genuine understanding. And if I set the right intention and leverage that access, that's the perfect testing ground. The perfect testing ground. Right. And, and that was my experience, not just in college, but also in law school. Because, you know, we got, I'm surrounded by mighty black men right now. And we all have different levels of education. We have to remember, too, why is perseverance, to your point, important? Because we were not made for those environments. As a matter of fact, most of those campuses are rooted in curricula that question our competency. Or we're not present at all. But we leverage. We know how to uh, finesse. We know how to hustle. And so I see whether it's a, a college campus, a corner, or the opportunity I've been waiting on for a lifetime. To your point, perseverance. I don't care what your college campus is. I don't, what, I don't care what your higher education is. There's an environment with something. How are you gonna utilize what's there to get what it is you want? And I think that because of the brand the access to resource on the college campus, sometimes they can incubate that kind of an experience. But when you're the first in your family to do it, you don't have no blueprint on how to leverage it appropriately. You gotta do it yourself. And then it takes another generation to learn how to do what they did, and that, that becomes difficult. But, but for me, no, I don't think college is necessarily a waste, because what experience is a waste? I think it's about how do we learn to leverage what is oftentimes a reduction in value in that context, because what college want meant, what, what it once meant is not what it means. So do you feel like it's an institution's responsibility to adjust to the, like, the demographic that it's serving? Because I feel like certain demographics or certain cities, you know, you might be from a factory town or this town is like a, a farming town, but the, the certain curriculums and different things aren't adjusted to the people that live in that town. They say, I believe... 20% of like all Americans stay in their hometown like for their life. So a lot of the, the jobs that they have to do is based around what's going on in their local state, you know? And I feel like maybe sometimes the different things that may be pushed are like broadband careers and broadband things rather than like serving the local community. Do you feel like, like maybe the institutions need to be a little bit more fluid? Because we talked about this the other day about uh, me and Tunji about um, just how sometimes you can work in an institution and it's like, some of the faculty members might tell you, well, I don't like the rules, but these are the rules. Like, I don't like this. Like, I wish I could do this, but it's like, what, what is that chink in the, like, the, 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 me the mechanics that is stopping them from being able to actually make real change that everybody sees that is needed, but it just hasn't been made yet? See, and, and again, I'm going to step back from my, I don't want to get on the soapbox, but what you're saying here is, I think it goes back to the, my response in the last question. What's the responsibility of the institution is what you just asked me. That's such a deep impact question because at the end of the day, my responsibilities are tied to who I serve. Facts. And if my campus doesn't look like me, then why do I think my campus wants to serve me? Mm. And that's a real conversation we have to have. I think that what a lot of institutions do, um, but I'm gonna, if I can be explicit and, and intentional on this platform, I think a lot of predominantly white institutions in this country's contexts have an incredible ability to market something that is not true as though it is. Mm -hmm. And you have so many black students that walk onto these campuses expecting to what? To be served. Mm -hmm. And that's not what they experience. And a lot of them come with an expectation that doesn't get met and believe they've been sold a lie. When in fact, it was the truth. The college just made a sale. And so part of what I'm sharing with you is I don't necessarily think these institutions have a responsibility to serve anybody other than who their stakeholders, board members, might be. Mm. I think it's about us in our positions and asking ourselves, why do we think these folks are here to serve us in the first place? And are there not people 
in our communities beyond the context of higher education or college that are teaching us the skills, that are empowering us with the knowledge, that are giving us access to the relationships and resources where I don't have to pay 50, 60, $70,000 a year to walk away with a piece of paper yeah. that sometimes is just that piece of paper. When I can take a course from a brother for $1,500. Well, this kind of gets, this gets to my dilemma when it comes to higher education because I don't, I, I do think the, the responsibility falls on you as an individual, um, but, but it's tough, right? Because you, you grow up in an in a, in a environment, let's just talk about school, high school. You grow up in an environment that the metric for success is college, mm-hmm. that you need to go, that you need to go, that if you do not go to college, you're less successful than other people who choose a different route. Like if you go to the military, that means you're a little bit dumber. Um, you know, that means if you are working, you're probably not smart enough to make it to the next level. So that's where you're going to end up and that's your lot in life. Um, and, and there's this, this conditioning and this story that has, you know, frankly been inputted in by the colleges. Colleges is a business. And I think for a long time in this country, we had to confuse that it was something else. And they, 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 they added that marketing and, you know, they wanted a funnel into their universities. They wanted more customers into u- their universities. And, and I think us, you know, I, I think especially in modern times, people need to realize um, that it is a business and that as an empowered consumer, you do not have to support the businesses that you do not agree with. I think for me, my personal experience was looking at the end result, the end product of college. And does that align with the kind of success that I want? And the kind of debt that we got to take on like you really got to ask these questions is, is it, is, is the value there? I, I, I love what you guys are talking about, about the mindset and the intentionality that you got to go in to an environment that has all of these opportunities, all of these resources for you to, t- to leverage. But a lot of us, that, that isn't the conversations that are happening in high school. It's just about getting there. If you can get the paper, you're good. That's wrong. That's wrong. And, and I think if you're, if you're not, asking young people and, and, and trusting them enough to take responsibility. Because I feel like, you know, we, we get into parenting uh, 16, 17, and 18 years old. 18 years old um, and I think we don't do enough coaching. We don't do enough. You're an empowered adult. You're an empowered young adult that you can make a right decision based on what you feel and what you want to do with your life. And a lot of parents and teachers and counselors say, you need to do this, Kamal. You know, because you're trying to figure your life out, you need to do you. This is your point of clarity. And we and we sign people up for a lifelong of debt, you know, to, to some people. Not everybody's situation isn't like that. Um, my, my issue is with putting the, the responsibility in the institution's hand is you're, you're asking a business not to work it within its own best interest. And, and, and that just is not, that's not how entrepreneurship works. And that, and that hit me deep because it's, I, I'm thinking about so many times where I, I work with a student and then they'll tell me like, no, nah, I don't even want to go to college. I want to do a trade. And it's like, it gets to a point where it's like, dang, I feel like we can no longer serve you. And a lot of uh, the administration feels like, oh, we can no longer serve you because we can't help you be successful anymore because the goal of high school is to go to college. And that is when you have to go above and beyond the actual institution. You talk about mentoring and it's just like, all right, so how can we help you get to your goal of this? And how can we help you like be great? But a lot of some a lot of faculty members, in my experience, it was just like it was purely helping them like get to that next level, helping them get to like post education, like secondary education. And it's just like the goal is just for them to be happy healthy and successful. And it does not have to be in the context of a college. I think we also get sold on, like colleges are brands. A lot of the successful one, the Harvards, the MITs, the Stanfords, the Michigan. LSU, the Michigan. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna leave that. I don't really have any dog in that fight. So I'm gonna leave that one alone. But you know, you hear this where parents love to put bumper stickers on the back of their cars. They love to put the license plates. You know, they, they love the brand and what that brand means, you know. And I think that's, I mean, that's fantastic marketing, frankly. That's fantastic branding, like by these institutions. But if we don't see it like that, if we just see it as, you know, this badge of merit, but what does that actually mean from like my success? You know, detach from a brand. You know, they ask us all the time to detach ourselves from the Louis V's, the Nikes, 
you know, all these brands that we signify as status symbols, Mercedes. What does that look like when you're detaching yourself from these institutions uh, that mean success? You know, like detach yourself from that because that that doesn't really define what that looks like on an individual level. So for me, it's I don't believe in institutions because they're faceless things. I believe in communities, even in the sense of when I'm in an institution, I'm building community. So I believe I believe it's a two way street when you look at it as a community, because then that individual that's serving me, that's a part of this business is a person and I'm a person. So when I look at the high school example, okay, I want to go into a trade versus, okay, when everybody else, the goal is college, college, college. If you're in my community and you're my person, we're going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. No matter what this institution is about. And for me, that's why the individual is so important. Because when somebody sees you, it's not just an employee. It's not number 25678. That's your ID number card. Like, nah, you're a part of my, your community. And I believe the difference, and we were talking about this yesterday as well, the difference is... Like 20 years ago, we'd look at leaders in the community and educators and be like, oh, no, nah, they were different, like the Harriet Tubman, the models that would sacrifice all these things in order to get this goal for you, for me, for us. And we look at ourselves like our different. Now, we would have to sacrifice the same. Would you be willing to lose your job so Ahmad could eat? Would you be willing to lose your job so Ahmad can get a trade? Would you be willing to expand the idea of where we are now for you? And the door I open for you will open for somebody else. And I don't know about the somebody else, but I'm open it for you. And, and it props another question. I wanted to throw this one to you, Murdoch, um, and we can open it up to the panel, obviously. But um, what do you feel like the area that we are least educated in? Like one area that you feel like we are the most uh, least educated in or the least educated in, rather? He took, he took the breath from me. That's crazy how he just did that right there. The least, my brother? That's tough. And it's tough because when I think about education, who's it coming from? And sometimes you were educated, we just haven't seen the fruit of your education yet. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like some things just sit dormant for a long time until they're provoked. My introduction, you know, they showed me a lot of love when you introduced me. Mm -hmm. I was a lawyer before I walked in the room. <laughs> I was a professor before I walked into the room. I was a business coach before I walked in the room. I was a couple of things you didn't talk about before I walked in the room. Mm -hmm but they were sitting dormant because it wasn't appropriate yet. So you talk about what are we or what we're not educated. Man, I don't know, bro. Because part of education, I think the best, what do they say, the best teacher is what, experience? Mm. And when I think about, we all brothers on here, when I think about the experience that young black men have, they first day out the womb, to the day that they're supposed to go to college, if they even make it that far, the 18 years, how many different experiences do they have? And I ain't talking about what happens inside the classroom. Yeah. I'm talking about just getting up, out the bed, the dreams you have at night that other people call nightmares. You know, so what are we least educated in? I don't know. Because we are, we are the genesis and the revelation. We sit at the core of everything. Now, another question might be, where do we need to be encouraged or more strategic in what we leverage? And you know, I'm about to go on my little soapbox. But I know I can't do that here. Get on but man, listen, but if, okay, really? Thank you. Because, <laughs> no, look, look, because I, I, you know, I just, our greatest asset as a people is our story. You heard me talk about it all the time, brother. Mm -hmm. Black stories, are the, first of all, three steps back. Uh, a mighty brother, it wasn't Murdoch, wasn't Amadi, it was Malcolm. Right? He said that the black woman, least protected, most neglected, most disrespected in the world, that was more than 50 years ago, still stands true today. Uh, if the black woman is the most neglected, most disrespected, and the least protected, that means the black man got to be the most dangerous. Now, if the black woman least protected, <laughs> most neglected, and it's unfortunate yeah, because yeah. the bar that that may have been for me comes to life in mass incarceration when we walk in our power, which is another kind of bar for another day. Yeah. But again, if the black woman, the least protected, the most neglected, most disrespected, black men are most dangerous. What about black folks who are non-binary or trans? They're not even seen as human. To fall in love with something that is the most neglected, the most disrespected, the least protected, the most dangerous, are not even seen as human, to love that is revolutionary. That's revolution. When I think about what is like, what's the most powerful thing that we need to learn is how valuable you are, right? Really, what, what does it cost for you not to become everything you're supposed to become? 
what we lose in the community when you don't become. Like when you start understanding all these different things. So for me, it's a totally different concept because I was Nigerian, right? And came in with the mentality of my culture and you getting an education. You go into college, there wasn't a maybe. This is what you're doing. And I came into the idea of the classroom. I wanted to be a speaker and I'm be a teacher. And I looked at other black men that hadn't had the same opportunities as me, that didn't have the same experiences. I knew I was going to succeed. School was just a game of finesse. Get your education, keep it pushing. It was never a difficulty. Then I looked around and friends that were just as smart as me, just as, you know, clean, they weren't living the same life. So I thought I was going to step into this classroom, speak into their life, and everything was going to be okay. And then I looked at it and it'd be like, nah, people have been doing this for 20, 30 years. They've been giving their all. They've been believing. And it's not okay. And then I just became obsessed of, okay, what is it really going to take? What is that most important thing? And though I was teaching science, the most important thing I would tell students, again, is this Benjamin E. Mays quote. We are all created to do something unique and something distinctive. And if you do not do it, it will never be done. You are irreplaceable. And I would give them this analogy of a piece of coal and a diamond. A coal is a non-renewable resource. When it is used up, we do not get another. You are coal right now. We do not replace you. The world will use you up regardless and pretend you're not valuable. But the thing is, you have to dig into that pressure. And when you were diamond, the shining is evident. You were always valuable. Don't get that twisted. You were valuable in the dark when you were still in the door, dirt. It just took somebody to pull you out, you to lean into that pressure, and now you shine. But it's them understanding that dynamic. When you understand that you are pivotal to this community, that you are irreplaceable, you move different. Now, now, can I feed off of it? Please. Can I feed off of it? Because he just talked about coal to diamond. In order to go from coal to diamond, you need a process, right? You asked me the question, what are we least educated in? I could talk about leverage. We have to become intentional about the processes that we use to go from coal to diamonds. Because you know what? There are certain processes that leverage black bodies to turn coal into diamonds. And we are diamonds. Yes, we are. But do I want to become a diamond that came at the product of someone else's demise? That fuels the same system Facts. I seek to fight by yeah. leveraging the value of my diamond. Mm. So what I'm saying is, when you love yourself, like he said, when you love yourself, the process of learning to love yourself is about leverage. And how do I discover that power is by knowing my story. And, and, and it goes back to something else my brother said too. There's power in one. There's a revolution in one, of one, for sure. Mm. But are we fighting against an individual? I'm not. Mm. I'm fighting against systems of racism, white supremacy, anti-blackness, misogyny, patriarchy, homophobia, transphobia. These are systems that didn't start or end with one person. And so that's the beauty, though, of a process in both a communal and in a business context. We don't scale through people. We scale through processes. But we are the people who are the genesis and the revelation. We existed before racism, white supremacy, and anti-blackness existed. And we will exist after it is dismantled. But it requires processes. We have to believe we're worth that process. And to college, does college teach me to believe I am worth going through a process that turns me from coals to diamonds without the demise of my own people? Heck no, because colleges and universities are the systems that created those systems turned coals to diamonds in my own demise. So I want to throw this question in there. It's, it's, it's so, because we talking about, you know, just the, uh, the effects of the education, and I want to talk about some of the effects of the lack of education. Uh, it's like it's something. It's like a, a running adage about how lack of education can lead to violence. It can lead to like lack of opportunities in our communities. Do you guys feel like that is an actual thing? Because you know, I, I see a lot of different, you know, fluent people, whether they be rappers, artists, and stuff, and talking about why they chose the street life. And it's like, man, well, I didn't have another choice. Do you feel like it's really a lack of opportunities, or is it just how unattractive? nine to five life looks or maybe skill trades or that life looks. I can throw this one to you. Come on. I'm, I'm a little bit confused by the question. Um, can you pose it one more time? So it's basically like, do you feel like th we just need to make nine to five work more attractive? Is it really not enough opportunities out here for people to go into and like take care of their family? Or is it really, because a lot of people like, there was no opportunity for me to work a nine to five job. And I do understand the context of that because um, 
I think it was King Von, he was on the interview and he was talking about how I can't work at McDonald's because if I work at McDonald's, somebody would come and shoot up to McDonald's. Mm -hmm. So he's like, I can't even, I'm coming from the streets, we can't work a normal nine to five job. So maybe institutions could have got him like a, a, a virtual type of job where he could work at a call center, but he can't work a typical job anymore. Is it a sense of that type of job being unattractive or is it actually he doesn't have an opportunity to get those type of jobs? That's a good question. Um, to come back, to kind of build on one of the previous questions about what, what are we least educated in, uh, I, I really like what you had to say about the leverage. I think entrepreneurial thinking is, is it's, it's not just entrepreneurship, it's not just business, but it's a, it's a way of thinking about putting yourself in a position of leverage, putting yourself in a position where you can create opportunities um, that, that, that might not be there. Like I, I do believe that the entrepreneurial, the entrepreneurial is the direct route to freedom. Um, and I, I think it starts with leveraging skills, um, leveraging the marketplace, getting involved in, in serving people's need. I think it creates a certain independence where if there are systems that you believe are, 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 are holding people back, I feel like the biggest, some of the biggest change makers are the entrepreneurs, are the business people in the community um, who, who, who can do things their way. Um, to answer the question more, a little bit more directly, though, um, th and this might be uh, a not commonly shared belief mm. um, amongst people, uh, but I, I think that, that there's a lack of people, there's a lack of encouragement to pursue your purpose. Mm. Um, and I think you know, there's there's a spiritual component to there that I can't like put a put a, uh, a the hammer on the nail and just nail it down. Like this is uh, the true path to uh, you know an abundance of opportunities. But there's something about finding where alignment and you can cross. You know, something about getting yourself in an alignment with what you're, what's really inside. What are you really trying to do? What are you really here on this earth to do? That I think does birth more opportunities than you kind of see. Like working at a Chick Fil A, you know, um, working at a Trader Joe's, working at a grocery store, working at a bowling alley. Like th these are these are meaningless jobs. I feel like a lot of people um, they see them, they're unappealing, but the experiences that you get from being in an environment that you don't like, dealing with customers that you don't have to, you know, going through the motions, I think, tests your character in a way that does help you define what am I good at? You know, like it, it, it creates that challenge that, okay, how do I show up in a way that other people value? And I think a lot of times people don't want to go through the ugly parts of that. I think even, even if you're a rapper or a musician or anything like that, you got to put your music out at some point. People are not going to love your first product, mm -hmm. you know? Um, you you got to test yourself out. I think the same is true, but just in, in different skills. Like, you're not just going to learn... You're not going to learn stuff if you're not willing to take the opportunities and the experiences that are going to teach you by being uncomfortable. Like you have to go through that journey. And I think as you're going through these journeys, it's just important to keep the purpose thing in mind because you're going to start to understand like, okay, people do really rock with this. Like I didn't know, you know, I thought this was just like something I was good at, like a gift, but no, like there's something there, you know? Um, and if, if you can keep that thing in mind and as you're going through these experiences, you're going to slowly start to move towards your North Star. And I love your point about entrepreneurship, and, but I, I kind of feel like entrepreneurship is already kind of like an attractive thing. But to your point, like how do we make like following that purposeful career path more attractive? Like how do we make embracing being a dentist a more attractive career path or going into being a financial manager, just uh, something that is in your natural propensity to do, but it might not be the most attractive as being an entrepreneur or as owning a, a clothing brand or whatever the case yeah. may be and being uh, be able to be all on social media and all, all this other stuff. Like, how do we make career paths more? If I could say one thing, and I'm going to pass it to Tunji, I, something that you even talk about a little bit is just the mindset of embracing failure. Mm -hmm. I think in our community, that's not really a cool thing at all. Mm -hmm. You know, like it is lame to be a failure. Like it is lame to be lame. Like it's lame to be a loser, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. failure requires that. Mm -hmm. At some, com 
part, like being a failure requires you to wear those labels comfortably, you know? And I think if, if, if we got to tell people it's okay to fail, mm -hmm. like it's okay to look lame. It's okay to feel like a loser because the thing that you're trying to cultivate, other people are not going to see the value in that. Uh, I'll jump in with this Bruce Lee quote. He said, to the failure point, don't fear failure, not failure. In great attempts, even failure is glorious. And that's the thing. Failure shows you who you are. We all need it. Whether you're a rapper, a dentist, a doctor, you're going to take your lumps. And that's, the, again, we go to the perseverance point. That's the, if you get anything, anybody from a college degree, I can start something and I can finish it. When it's hard. When the class didn't make sense. I'm like that. Right, that's what that degree says. Do you have that in your life? You didn't go to college? Okay, show me. Show me. You can go with this job that you didn't like and you can work your way up. Because I'm like that. Put me anywhere, I'm a win. We respect all those people. And that's the stories we love. The rappers, the singer, any artist that's still here today that you love, they're talking about their journey. They're talking about the ugly parts. The reality is you love failure. You just don't love it when it's yours. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you get to see the end product. That's one of them ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, nah, real talk. Not when it's you. Not, not when you're the one sitting down taking that L and be like, am I going to get back up? But when it's Kobe, oh, yeah. You know, when it's LeBron, oh, yeah. He, he didn't win these championships. Look at him now, yeah. You're a fan of LeBron. You're really a fan of yourself. You just haven't finished your story. I wanted to, to touch on that, the, the, the whole point of just failure. Is it, and I can throw this one to you, Murder, is it bad that sometimes we connect our greatest over our failures? Because I go to, like, just listen to you talk earlier before the cameras came on, just talking about some of the things that you overcame. I feel like I connected way deeper when you just talking about, because I've been through that too. Yeah. Like, is that, is, would you say that's a, a good or a bad thing, or maybe it's neither, uh, that we connect so deeply over our failures? Like, what's the importance of, like, exposing your failures to help other people be motivated? You know what I honestly think is important, too? Because we got to break the machine, too, right? Mm -hmm. it's something that's super duper important. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Man, it's something. <laughs> no, and, I, and oh, but, but what machine oh. am I talking about? Part of what I'm talking about, too, is we like what we're given. If you are constantly fed that failure is sexy, then what's gonna be sexy? Failure. Facts. If you, if you are Facts. fed the fact that winning is sexy, then what's gonna be sexy when? So you, to go back to your original question about the king, yeah, look, I don't wanna be broke. But you know, the deep part about it is broke people who ain't broke. It's people who look broke that ain't broke. And it's people who <laughs> look wealthy, excuse me, it's people who look rich that ain't rich. Mm. But it's about that look. Mm. And guess what? That is not because our people are childish. That's not because our people are improper stewards of our blessings. That is a product of media. That is a product of natural human instinct. When I see a color, I have a reaction. If I see a certain color, I'm gonna have a certain kind of a reaction. When we see certain things, we're gonna have a certain kind of a reaction. And then when the thing I see is subliminally or unconsciously attached to this word that I've been conditioned to believe is appropriate, mm -hmm. what am I going to do? I'm going to begin to attach these images of what things look like, not what they are, mm -hmm. but what they look like to this thing I've been told is important. Mm -hmm. By people, watch this, super duper tragic but honest, who haven't even experienced either one of those things. The thing they're asking me to achieve, success. And the thing I'm being tied to that success, riches and glory. One of the things about college that we got to talk about too, to bring it back to higher education, is the reason why higher education means what it does to us is because of what a lot of our parents told us college was supposed to be. Nice. But that's because of what college was supposed to be to them. 20 years ago, college meant something very different than it does right now. But guess what? To buy a home today means something very different today than it did 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Come on. That's the context. A text without context is a pretext for counting people. You got these quotes, so I had to come correct with the quotes. Come on, now. My oratorical <laughs> mentor, Dr. Frederick Douglass Ains III, he <laughs> says that a text <laughs> Don't get without... Me. <laughs> now listen, listen, but they, they told me I had to. A text without context is a pretext for counting people. That's what Dr. Frederick Douglass Ains III said. The Murdoch version of that says if you can take a, a word out of a sentence, I promise I'm bringing it back. 
<laughs> a word out of a sentence, a sentence out of a paragraph, a paragraph out of a page, a page out of a book, a book out of a narrative. You can make people think whatever you want them to, man. And so often, because of our predicament, we lack context. Because we ain't been so many places before. So all we have is what? To see. So what did I see? When I was at my job in 1950, the person who was my boss went to college. That's why he's my boss. So when I go home to talk to my baby boy, what am I going to tell my baby boy to do? You need to go to school. Mm. But what school do I go to? Well, the boss man went to university of... So maybe that's where you should go, son. Because I don't want you to be in the same condition I was. The difficulty is, did our father control what school boss man went to? Did our father even walk on that campus? But what did my father know? That the boss went to college. And what do I want my son to be one day? A boss. Mm. Man, but, but life moves so much faster than that. I had something I wanted to uh, throw to you, Tunji, because it was an uh, earlier conversation we was having about black men in education. Yeah. And you was just talking about how when more black men are in education, when more black men are in that classroom, that, that effect is like, it's a trickle-down effect on everybody in the whole school. Like, yeah. can you talk about just like, why there seems to be like a lack of black, represent, black male representation in a lot of these inner city schools. Because like you said, it's not fed as a dope job. Nope. Right? Nobody wants to be the one standing in front having to deal with us mm -hmm. in the context that we've seen it. Mm -hmm. But when you step in, now I trained some uh, black male teachers in LA, shout out to Teacher Village, Teacher Village Initiative. But when you step into that classroom, and I was scared mm -hmm. when I first stepped into that classroom, because I know what it means when you have somebody that got that dog in them, that you're going to win. Mm -hmm. That I'm going to be great at this so you win. I know what it, I've seen what it looks like. You've seen movies and different things where that teacher is there and these kids win. And I was scared not to be him. Not about, oh, I'm so great, but what does that mean for their lives? So when I got into that mode of they are going to win, you, you hit a different gear of energy, of love, of focus, of creativity. And that's what led to entrepreneurship for me now. Because I stepped into that space, and then the data showed that if you have a black male teacher, whether you white, you Asian, you Indian, it doesn't matter, male, female, anything in between, you're going to be more successful. Right, and I think it's rooted in love. I think when you've been in that classroom and you struggled, you love a little bit harder. When you see yourself in everybody. So I think it's, it's one of those things where they have to see it, right? And you, you know you get that energy when that person walks into the room. I always say that real men empower. Mm -hmm. A real man walks into the room and you get bigger. You feel more capable. Yeah. It's like I'm Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan just walked in like, we about to get buckets. Okay. Y'all ain't, ain't getting no points. You ain't scoring. It's, 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 you know what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. You feel the fear. I feel stronger. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when you walk into it. Like, to this day, and that's what I, I would, if I could recommend anything, get a college education so you could be a teacher. Mm. If you can be cold as a teacher, as a professor, there is not a job on this planet you can't do. The confidence I came out of, once I, once I figured out how to teach black kids and Latino kids, kids how to learn, I could teach myself anything. Mm. The question now I ask is, what language do I learn? Do I want to learn? Do I want to be a doctor? Do I want to be a pilot? Do I want to be a dentist? Mm. The confidence you get once you're able to give and do that, is different. Mm. But the kids need to see it too. I want to touch on that re respect piece because we talked about this Ooh. before as well. Um, I was riding over here with the, the Uber, my Uber driver when I first got here and um, he was talking about how his wife is a teacher mm. and how it's hard for a lot of older educators to deal with those students because they're not used to that level of respect. He said young edu younger educators, they have a little bit more energy. They, they can kind of, you know, yeah. balance that a little bit. Um, but I feel like that could be something as even for like black male educators, like that level of disrespect and just the mental shift that you have to make in order to understand, like, you know, regardless if you disrespect me, cuss me out, spin my, f I'm still the man in the room. Yeah. And that was the number one thing that I had to establish when I was working in the class. Like, listen, like I'm still the man. Like, so at yeah. the end of the day, I'm here to serve y'all. Yeah. Like y'all just want to test to see if like I'm going to break out of my manhood when you right. disrespect right. me. I'm still the man. I'm still going to be calm and cool and collective. 
So at the end of the day, like, could you just talk about that piece? Because I think this is important about, because you was like, man, sometimes I have to tell a student, can you step out the room? Yeah. And it's not about you, it's about me. Yeah. Like, you know right. what I'm saying? Like, what did I do? No, it's not about you, it's about me. I know me, I need right. you to step out, you know? In order to maintain this demand, I need you to step out, you know? Yeah. Could, you, could you talk about And that? people think strength is being swole, being big, being strong, being intimidated. It's not. Maya Angelou said, no one cares what you're talking about until they know you love them. I spent two weeks setting the stage of community letting them know I love them. So when the moment comes when you want to disrespect me, when you want to come at me, and I'm your person, I know this isn't about me. And I look at you, and I said this the other day, I'll be like, Ahmad, I'm disappointed in you. You better than that. I know you. Step out for a second, because I need to get myself together. Because I do not want to say anything to speak against who you are, because I know who you are. Nah, just give me a minute. They be like, no, nah, but Mr. Mr. No, 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 no. This isn't about you. Like, let me, let me get myself right. That hits way harder. It always has. I don't have to yell once, I know, once you know that I'm loved. And that's why community is so important. That's why knowing that student and different people being in that school building, whether it's a college or a high school, because when that 60-year-old teacher is tired, you have a tune out of bio, a black man next door to be like, hey, come here, like, chill out. And it doesn't take that energy because I have this connection with this student. And I can say like, nah, she loves you too. You know how long she stayed after school grading your paper? How many revisions did she give you? How many second, third chances? How dare you talk to her like that when she loves you? How dare you? And then you connect the dots that they don't see. And then they start moving different. But the, the challenge is also to talk to that 60-year-old teacher Come at times. On, I was waiting. Come and be on. like, don't talk to that man like that. Boy, I Right, speak life into him. Your words matter. That hate came out because he helped, he felt hate from you. Like, I, I did want to uh, toss the question to Murdoch too, because I kind of wanted to get it from a collegiate perspective as well about that lack of representation of black male professors, teachers. So can I? I, I can be honest in the space because this is just talking. I ain't never felt stupid till I got to law school. <sighs> never felt stupid till I got to law school, and I did. I felt like a freaking idiot. My experience and my success by God's grace and entrepreneurship came because of my, the stupidity I felt inside of the classroom. Mm. And, and the stupidity I felt inside of the classroom was because I had law school professors, old white males and middle-aged white women who were telling me that I would not pass the bar. And I thank God he allowed me to raise the bar through entrepreneurship. I thank God for that every day. But you know the other thing? It was not just when they told me that I wasn't going to succeed. It was because in those rooms, I didn't have people who spoke a language I understood. That's the other beauty of representation. And not, uh, I'm a political scientist by trade, right? So I studied political science and religion when I was in school. In politics, there's two kinds of representation. There is descriptive representation, right? So descriptive, I can look a certain kind of a way, right? I am black. So I can be described as black. In my nature, what do people think? I just got to put more black men inside of the, and we do. Mm. We need more brothers, for mm. sure. Mm. We need more brothers. Talk, talk, mm. talk. But some of these brothers <laughs> got some words coming out of their mouth. Yeah. That if I yeah. close my eyes, Facts. I wouldn't know I was looking at a brother. That That's descriptive most. representation. Mm -hmm. The beauty of substantive representation is that it, it, and, it and, and again, some, Ooh, I, I get excited, I gotta bring it back. Mm. The beauty of substantive representation is it builds off descriptive. Mm. I don't want less black men in the room. I do, I want more black men in the room. Cause can't nobody tell me I'm a man to a black boy, mm. like a black man. Mm. I don't care how well-meaning, respectfully, Fair. or loving, mm. someone else might be. But can't nobody tell me who he is, like someone who I relate to because I see myself in him. And not just because you care, but there's something intangible, almost spiritual, that when I hear you speak and I experience your energy, I say, wow, there is something of you in me. And there is something of me in you. Mm -hmm. And so the substantive representation doesn't just say, I'm a black man so we can connect. Mm -hmm. It says, I'm a brother who understands what blackness is, what it means to succeed in spite, and also understands that 
None of this would be here without us. Even though they tell us this can exist without us being here. The beauty of our story, land in my plane, back to law school. It wasn't just bad because they told me I wouldn't succeed. It was bad because I never saw myself. So even if I got an A on the exam, mm. even if I wrote the most Iraq is a, is a framework that lawyers use, identify the issue, mm. establish the rule that responds to that issue, analyze that rule according to the facts, and then restate your conclusion. I could have the best Iraq in the world. And it's still a fight if you're picking up what I'm putting down. Mm. I could have the best Iraq in the world and it would still be a fight to see myself as being successful in that environment. And, and man, that's why it's important for us to see ourselves substantively in every environment. That's why exposure is so important. I don't, cause, cause this is a strong brother. I mean, I could tell he got the personal training certificate for sure, but he is not just strong because of his physique or because of his volume, but because he knows about value. Mm. And that value is not because somebody told him what to do. The value is because he understands the nature of a problem. Mm. How, do you how do you provide value? By solving people's problems. And to be responsive to our people's right. problems does not come from somebody else's playbook. Especially not a book full of plays that were made to see our demise. Mm. It came from people who were proximal to the problem. Tunji is proximal to the freaking problem. That's you can provide a solution that is not dis descriptive, mm. but it is substantive. And that's why I needed to see Tunji in the freaking classroom mm. when I was in law school. I'm done. Mm. Because you know what? I can be honest. I thank God I'm here. Mm. And I thank God because of what we experienced to get here, literally. Mm. Yeah. But I thank God I'm here. Mm. You wanna, and, and, and even though I'm thankful to be here, had I seen a Tunji at law school, I wouldn't have been here. I may have been what I thought I wanted to be when I was in the seventh grade. Mm. I'll never be Thurgood Marshall. I'll never be Barack Obama. Those dreams were murdered when I walked into law school. And I thank God I'm where I am now. I thank God I'm Murdoch. I wasn't meant to be Malcolm or Martin. I was meant to be Murdoch. Oh. But my God, Murdoch could have been a little bit different <laughs> had he seen a Tunji. Mm. What, and what, what, is, what really That's about, me though. Right? Yeah. And you talked about this where you had a principal at Mays that was a lawyer previously, an entrepreneur and all this. It's different when you can hit the value piece, the principal piece, and that entrepreneur piece like, I don't have to be here. I'm here because I love you. Wow. I can get paid 12 different ways. Wow. You can be an educator and have the things that you want, the things, not even things that you want, the things that you need for your family. Come on, I'm doing it. And it's all this dynamic of, really, if you look at it like the Matrix, I think this is the best way I can look at it. We always look at, oh, I want to be Neo, the one. When really it's a process where you're Neo, you're the one, and then you're Morpheus. Mm. And you're stepping in that classroom, I'm looking to another kid, and I'm like, you're the one too. Mm. I've been in the Matrix, I went to college, I graduated, I'm back, and I'm telling you, you can do it too. And you look like me. You can have it. The question is, what do you want to do? and then you give them a path. That's, that's the, what I found is the difference maker. You say basketball, that's, that's it? You 5'2", you want to be in the NBA, you serious? Because I'm gonna bet on you. Mm -hmm. I ain't got money like that, I'm gonna put resources on you. You using up your mama's time, you using up all this energy, because we believe in you. Mm -hmm. And then you start getting the best out of somebody. And then when they fail, they know what their best looks like and opportunities open up. Mm -hmm. The hardest part is getting a kid to give their best. And it, and it requires betting on them. You it requires being that, that like, okay, I'm going to lose if we lose together. Mm -hmm. Let's run it. I wanted to throw out this question because it kind of touches on your early point, just, just talking about the value and tunes, just in that representation. Um, one of the questions I had was just about this concept of a high-value man and, you know, just how a lot of people talk about um, people doing skill trades and, you know, outside of that whole entrepreneur sector, they don't really see them as, like, high value and all this stuff. I wanted to throw this question to you, Kamal. We can open it up, obviously. Uh, what do you feel like is a high, high value, value man? man? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I, I think a lot of the attributes that, that I know Tunji as represent me as high value man. I think, like, holding yourself accountable or just accountability in general, that word, I think, needs to be Amen. present in the ingredient of a high value man. I think honesty mm -hmm. is another key ingredient in a high value man. I, I think one of the reasons that makes him such a, a force to be reckoned with, especially in the classroom, 
is that he's going to keep it a buck with Amen. you. And there's not a lot of teachers. And, and I'm, I'm going to speak for the, from the student perspective because I was a student and I had black teachers. Uh, I was never a teacher. So I can just speak from the perspective I know. There's not a better person who can pull you out of the social hierarchy and all the stuff that you worried about as a kid, all the games you play and all the girls, all the politics that you doing as a kid. Nobody can pull you out of that like a black man can. Because the honesty of I see through all of this mm -hmm. and then the, the honesty in me where I'm having the internal dialogue, like I see you and me. And it's just like, damn, you know, like nobody can pull you out like that, who can cut through the noise of all the, the shenanigans that are going, all the games that you're playing, right? But I think, you know, not, not every teacher can do that. I had black men teachers who couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. I had black women teachers who could do that. I had white teachers who could and couldn't do that. Like, I think it does require a level of value that you have to have as a person. So value to me, a, a lot of it is intrinsic. You know, a lot of it is, it is it's intrinsic. And if you're able to bet on what you feel, you know, those principles, are you a principled person? You know, a lot of that tends to manifest outward, you know, in, in, in your external reality. Like you can't be a high value person intrinsically and it not manifest eventually. Like you might not be in your moment right now, but if you maintain that, you're going to find that value that 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 is more visible, you know, um, but but it definitely starts with some of those things, those uncomfortable things like accountability and honesty are the two that that resonate with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that resonates with me, too. I think it's just that vulnerability as well. Like, you know, um, just this vulnerability, man. And, and I, I think it's just like like you said about principles as well, like. Oftentimes we we idolize or, or look up to people who have like nice things, man. You know what they will do, but you don't know what they won't do. It's like the limits, the 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 the, the boundaries that you set in yourself. You know what I'm saying? How far are you willing to go for that money? How far are you willing? Like you you, I feel like a principled man will only go so far for certain things. Once it's outside of his principal boundaries, like I can't go that far, man. I don't care what the goal is. If it's outside of these principal boundaries, I don't care what the shiny object is. I you know? And just again, to speak from the perspective of the student, those boundaries get really blurry. Mm. Those boundaries get really blurry, you know, um, because I, I think a lot of students are in the confines of a social setting, you know, and, and what is defined as the boundaries is kind of, communally defined, you know, like it's, it's not defined as a 14 year old, you know, it's not defined as a 15 year old, unless you came from a household that had really strong parents, you know, that, that place that go ahead. No, I realized like, I wouldn't consider myself a high value man until I be, a, I was a teacher and I stepped into that classroom and I realized I wasn't because that students have that radar for honesty. Right, and I, and my first principal, black woman, she's like, oh, you're going to have a boys' academy class. Mm -hmm. So I'm after school, they're like, I, what about young ladies? And I'm like, treat them like your sister. And like, are you doing that on the weekends? I'm like, Jesus Christ. And then you're forced to look at yourself. Right, you're forced to like, how am I really treating people? How am I really moving? Am I a man of my word? No. Do I, when I say something, is it done? Like God said it? No. Mm -hmm. Like that level of accountability to look at myself. And this is the hard part. To sit at yourself, look at yourself in the mirror and be like, I'm not there yet. And then principles, I just saw this this morning, principles aren't principles until they cost you something. Mm -hmm. And when you have to say no to somebody you love, mm -hmm. to stay focused, to take care of yourself, and this is what I realized. How value men aren't resentful? Because what happens is this. Most men, you have a lot of demands on your time. You have a lot of asks for you. Like, can, I, can you do this? Can you do this? And you're like, yes, I got you. Yes, I got you. Yes, I got you. Yes, I got you. Now you spread through 10 and you drop the ball. Mm -hmm. When you should have said no. No to this, no to this, no to this, and yes to this. Now you 100 for 100. And when you say something, it's done. You're the same man. Just that no is everything. And I found for me and for other men I've seen, when you don't say the no's, you're resentful. You know, all these people are taking from me, taking from me. When you just didn't have the courage to say no, you showed up as a coward and now you're blaming everybody else. Can I feed off of it? Please, if you don't mind. Um, something I teach my students is how to provide value. The value proposition equation is under promise, the product of an under promise and an over delivery. That's how we exceed expectations. 
Why is providing value about exceeding expectations? Because when failure is the standard, when failure is the expectation, exceeding should be our standard. And again, when we are providing value to each other, I'm thinking about black men providing value to black boys. I'm thinking about black folks providing value to black people. Part of what's important is we are working against systems that are rooted in us not succeeding. So I don't wanna just meet you here. I wanna aim for the stars and land on the moon, right? The reason I bring it up to what he said is because the courage to say no is rooted in understanding your capacity. The reason why we underpromise is because I do not have to exceed my capacity to exceed expectations. Facts. When I think that I have to exceed my capacity to exceed expectations, mm -hmm. that's why I can't sustain. And that's rooted in the same machine mentality that makes black folks think that black folks can never be the boss. That's what, that's what loops us out of our leverage. That's what makes us lose our leverage. And so I love what you say right there yeah. because it is courage. And even if you don't think you have the courage to do so, remember it's about capacity. But that's why I think the greatest thing we have to learn, the greatest thing we have to teach. And I loved what you said about when you knew that you could teach, you could do anything. Because the greatest teachers are the greatest learners. Your capacity to teach, you, again, experience the greatest teacher, but you know you learn something when you can teach somebody else. That's the beauty of a mentor. Right? Because right? when you can mentor somebody, because you know what, I can, dang, you know, I went through something. Now let me tell you how, if, and you still gonna do it, because you got experience it yourself. Right. But how can I coach you through making the mistake I told you you didn't have to make, but when you make it, you ain't got to suffer the same consequences mm -hmm. on the back end of that mistake. The, the, the only, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. the, the, the only other thing I, I, I wanted to say um, was, Always keeping in mind that we are in a moment. Like right now, we're in a moment. And all moments have contexts. So yes, all that these high value men just told us what high value men might be described as. But who created the term of a high value man? It was not a high value man. And I think it's important when we're talking to young boys about what it means to be valuable. They gotta remember, some folks will never see your value because they don't think you were valuable in the first place. And I, I, man, I'm loving this conversation, man, but we, but we do have to land the plane. So. Can, 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 I, can, I, can I make one more piece of thought before we land? Real, qu real quick. We do have to land the plane. But, I, but you know, we know we normally finish the show off with this last question, so I wanna throw it to you being the guest. Um, what do you feel like is the most revolutionary thing we can do as people? As a people? As a people. I'm a, what camera? <laughs> right here? Oh. Oh. Now I said it before, I'm gonna say it again. Loving yourself is a revolutionary action and you are worth the revolution. And the reason why is because it does, the revolution does start with one, the one inside of yourself. We don't dismantle systems of racism and white supremacy by individual people who speak the loudest and look the strongest. It requires systems to be able to do it. But you know who? creates those systems, institutions, right? Now, and those institutions are faceless in large part. That's why we can't be rooted and have faith in those. But in order to build those institutions, you know what it requires? It requires leaders. And those leaders establish cultures Facts. that keep institutions together, that can assemble systems to fight the systems we seek to dismantle. That all starts with you believing you have the capacity to lead. And if it's not a group of five or 500, it's these five fingers right here. Five, 10, 15, 20, 20 fingers right here. 20 fingers, fingers. you know what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. It's your, your capacity to lead yourself. And you believe you're worth leading when you love yourself. Oh. And you are worth loving. The most revolutionary thing that one person can do is fall in love with their self. So black boy that's watching this, when you see yourself, I pray you see me. And you see my brother, and my brother, and my brother. And because they love themselves, they love me too. And invited me to come and talk to you. Fall in love with yourself, the world ain't never gonna be able to stop you. That's a mother freaking fact. Mic drop. <laughs> Man, we appreciate y'all for tuning in to this episode of Roundtable with Rev One. Make sure y'all tune in to the next episode, man. And we really appreciate y'all. We got my good brother, <laughs> Tunji out of bio, hey, Professor Anthony Murdoch II, Kamal Alatunji. I'm Ahmad the Poet, and we'll see y'all in the next one. It's love.